I am happy to share this with you today in what will hopefully go down in history as one of the greatest treatises on the state of the black church and the history of our nation. Over 2,000 years ago, a Jewish carpenter under whose cross we stand today gave his life as a ransom for many. This momentous sacrifice came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of black men and women who had been seared in the flames of their withering depravity. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their spiritual captivity. But over 2,000 years later, the black church still is not mature. 2,000 years later, the lives of many black Christians are still sadly crippled by the manacles of church tradition and the chains of biblical ignorance. 2,000 years later, the black church lives on a lonely island of private biblical understanding in the midst of a vast ocean of honest biblical interpretations. 2,000 years later, the black church is still languished in the corners of American evangelicalism and finds itself a hermit in his own land. And so I share this with you today to elucidate a shameful condition. In a sense, I share this to call for biblical reformation. When the prophets and apostles wrote the magnificent words of the Old and New Testaments. They were providing a revelation from God to which every Christian was to take heed. This revelation entailed a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the promise of eternal life if they believed in Christ and repented of their sin. It is obvious today that a large segment within the black church has defaulted on proclaiming the central promise of scripture insofar as the evidence for unconverted church members is concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred mandate, some leaders within the black church has given church members false assurance of their salvation, a practice which has led many members down a dangerous path. But I refuse to believe that the black church is spiritually bankrupt. I refuse to believe that there are inadequate Bible teachers all throughout the black church. And so I share this with you, a message that will give us upon reformation the riches of spiritual freedom and the assurance of sound biblical teaching. I also share this with you to remind the black church of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to proclaim the real promises of scripture. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of church segregation to the sunlit path of congregational diversity. Now is the time to lift the black church from the quicksands of race-based denominations to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make unity a reality for all of God's children. It might be fatal for the black church to overlook the urgency of the moment this sweltering summer of some black evangelicals legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of reform and repentance. 2012 is not an end, but a beginning. And those who think that young black evangelical Christians have no voice in the black church will have a rude awakening if the black church returns to business as usual.
and there will be neither rest nor tranquility in the black church until the leaders are responsive to a biblical reformation. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of the black church until the bright day of reformation emerges. But there is something that I must say to my black evangelical brothers who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of biblical reformation. In the process of seeking these positive changes, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for reform by drinking from the cup of divisiveness and rebuke. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into unbiblical behaviors. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting social opposition with biblical truth. The marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the black evangelical community must not lead us to a repudiation of all black pastors for many of our black church leaders as evidenced by their faithfulness to sound biblical teaching has come to realize that their mission is tied up with our mission. And they have come to realize that their vision is inextricably bound to our future. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always stay in prayer. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of biblical reformation, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied. As long as preachers within the black church are disseminators of the unspeakable doctrines of the prosperity gospel, we can never be satisfied. As long as our minds, heavy with the skeptics' criticism of the Bible, are not being taught how to defend what we believe, we can never be satisfied. As long as black churches emphasize the importance of tithes and offerings more than evangelism and apologetics, we can never be satisfied. As long as our children are merely taught Bible stories and given shallow answers to their serious questions, we cannot be satisfied. As long as black church members in Mississippi cannot explain the gospel and black church members in New York have not even heard the true gospel. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until the black church undergoes a radical nationwide biblical reformation of the highest order. I am not unmindful that some of you have experienced great trials and tribulations. Some of you have just finished preaching your Sunday morning sermon. You have been the veterans of church reform. Continue to work with the faith that relentless loving challenges to the black church are redemptive. Go back to Union Seminary. Go back to the AME Church Headquarters. Go back to the National Baptist Convention. Go back to your traditional churches. Go back to the prosperity preachers. Go back to the storefronts and mega churches of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, and so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the New Testament dream. I have a dream that one day the black church will rise up and live out the true meaning of its anthem. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to our God.
I have a dream that one day on the pews of AME churches, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will sit down together in the church as brothers. I have a dream that one day even the AME denomination, a denomination sweltering with the heat of its heritage, sweltering with the heat of tradition, will drop its racially identifiable name because of its love for the brethren. I have a dream that my niece and nephews will one day visit a black church where they will not be taught about their African heritage, but will be taught the transforming truths of sacred scripture. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day over in New York with its liberal seminary, with its professors having their lips dripping with the words of the social gospel and black theology, one day right there in New York, liberal black pastors and theologians will embrace true biblical teaching and join hands with evangelical pastors and theologians as followers of Christ. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. And this is my hope, and this is the faith that I continue to write with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of division a stone of unity. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of the black church into a beautiful symphony of Christ-honoring congregations. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to preach the gospel together, to sing together, to stand true to our God together, knowing that we will be rewarded one day, and this will be the day. This will be the day when members of the black church will be able to sing with new meaning, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And if the black church is to be a great body of believers, this must become true. And so let reformation begin. With the liberal seminaries of the North, let Reformation begin with the mighty megachurches of the South. Let Reformation begin with the black nonprofit organizations of the East. Let Reformation begin with the black Baptist conventions of America. Let Reformation begin with the leadership of the AME denomination. But not only that, let Reformation begin with the sermons of prosperity preachers. Let Reformation begin among the writings of black liberal theologians. Let Reformation begin among advocates of black theology. From every mountainside, let Reformation begin. When this happens, when we allow Reformation to begin, when we let it begin with every seminary and every church, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when every member of the black church, young men and old men, pastors and laymen, Baptists and Methodists, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of a new Christian hymn, Reformed at last, reformed at last, thank God Almighty the black church has been reformed at last.